Hello all, welcome to another video. Rambling Canuck here today will be the first of a, of a series of reviews. I'm thinking with the Star Trek Picard series coming out, I will review the TNG movie, starting with Generations and ending with Nemesis. Now before I get into the review, let me start off by saying that I will not be showing clips of the movie as to avoid copyright. Instead, I will be giving my thoughts on the movie in question. This will also not be a scene-by-scene -scene breakdown, rather just my thoughts on some of the key parts and characters. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's begin. The movie starts out with a bottle of wine drifting through space. It breaks on a hull of a ship. We are later to find out it's the Enterprise B. And then after some very nice shots of the Enterprise B, we move inside to see Kirk, Scotty, and some of the original cast from TOS entering the bridge, mobbed with cameras and reporters. Kirk looks absolutely unimpressed and kind of like a deer in the headlights. The reporters are interrupted by Captain John, who I will get into in a couple of minutes because in my opinion, he is the absolute lamest captain I've ever seen in Star Trek but I'll get to that in a minute so after a brief introduction and a few other conversations uh, they're set to go they're ready to leave space dock and the captain asks Kirk to do the honors so he does and they make they, they they start their their little shuttle run which is only supposed to be to Pluto and back and of course um, they get a distress call and the only reason I'm kind of going uh, scene by scene at the moment is to bring light to what I commented earlier about the the captain that they have portraying for the captain of the Enterprise B. So they get the distress call. He very, very reluctantly, after finding out there's no other ships in the area, reluctantly sets course. And the whole time, when the camera's on Kirk, it shows Kirk just, just itching, just itching just itching to just take his place because you can just tell he disagrees with everything this guy is doing and Kirk just does not like being a, being on the sidelines at all and this is very well shown in Kirk's body language and he just, just can't stand not being the one in control and this becomes very evident very soon so they get there and there's two ships and it's caught in a in a temporal electrical storm kind of thing and they're unable to save the first one it explodes and every time that they come up with a solution they find out that the Enterprise B isn't equipped with it uh, they wanted to use photon torpedoes they don't get equipped till Tuesday they wanted to use transporter. They, so finally, the captain basically gives up the chair to Kirk and says, you do this because I can't, which I have a big issue with. If he's captain, if he's made it to the rank of captain, shouldn't he be a little bit more capable? Um, he just seems so inadequate. Um, to me, he comes across as like an ensign or a Starfleet cadet, and they're on a training mission, and it's his first time being put as captain. He drew the short straw, and he's the captain in the simulation, so he's never really had any real-life experience in the chair, and he just buckles under pressure completely. He, he just has no idea what he's doing. Or at least that's how he comes across. He's just absolutely there to be there. He has no competence, no nothing. 
it just makes it so hard to believe he could make the rank a captain. I just don't understand. So, long story short, um, the, between Scotty and Kirk, they come up with a plan. Um, the captain relinquishes the chair to Kirk and was going to go do it instead of sending somebody else on board to do it. Mm. Kirk stops him and Kirk goes does it. So they have to change the uh, deflector dish. So Kirk goes down and of course the ship is getting pulled into the temporal anomaly and they're trying to get out. They can't so that's why Kirk is going to go do this. So Kirk manages to do it just as they initiate the deflector dish and they're pulling away the Enterprise B is struck by an electrical zap hull breach right where Kirk is uh, of course Scotty goes down with the new captain and one of the other um, old TOS uh, members and they find that Kirk is gone. Presumed dead. And then we zap ahead 78 years into the future. And our first look at uh, Picard and the crew of the Enterprise D is on a sailing ship. In the middle of the ocean. For what reason, I don't know. Uh, it's later revealed that this is a... Um, way of handing out rank. The wharf is getting a promotion, so this is just pop and circumstance. Uh, there's a few comedic bits, and then there's a message from Earth. Picard takes it. He's very, very distraught, and this will come into the plot later. Um, and he leaves the holodeck shortly after that. Riker is informed of a distress call. So he calls Red Alert, asks for Picard to come to the bridge. He does. And the, the screen shows a station that has come under attack. And after determining there's no other vessels... Picard orders Riker, who Picard is still shaken up. You could just tell something's just not not sitting right with him, and he's just not into it. So he orders Riker to go and investigate, and he's short with him and then leaves. So then they beam down, and through investigating, they find the... What we'll later find out is the main antagonist of the whole movie. Uh, under a bunch of rubble, they find um, Dr. Sauron. Uh, probably pronouncing that wrong. Please forgive me. This is kind of my first review, so it's going to be a little shaky. Um, and... Riker asks him what happened. He said it happened so fast. Then Riker is called over, and he finds a. He's pointed to a dead Romulan. So, so they determined it was a Romulan attack. Um, and it just—I don't know the the, the scene kind of falls flat. Um, now, uh, what I did forget to mention was that um, you see uh, back in the, when they were on the Enterprise B, the Enterprise B did save a few people from the, sh the second ship before it was destroyed. And in the survivors, there's two characters that you will recognize. One, the main antagonist, and to Guinan, who, if you watch TNG, was on the Enterprise D. So, uh, 
again, this is my first review, so I'm kind of feeling it out as I go. Bear with me, please. So, um, now, there is, um, once they're done uh, with their little investigation and it's pointed out that there's a dead Romulan, it cuts to Jordy and Data. And Data is conflicted because he thought he did something funny back in back when they were on the sailing ship and it turned out to be not so funny and so he's kind of at a loss so he decides that now is the best time of forever to put in his emotion chip so Jordy reluctantly puts in his emotion chip and my thoughts on this is it really didn't need to be in this movie um the whole thing of Data getting the emotion chip is nothing more than a plot device. Um, it helps to be able to take Data out of certain circumstances where if he was just Data, he would be able to handle the situation. But because of the emotion chip, plot device, he can't. So to me, it just seems like another storyline that really didn't need to be there and with everything else in the movie it just seemed like one more thing added on that just kind of really stuck out like a sore thumb that really didn't need to be there but that's just my opinion so then um it's found that um they were looking. It's figured out that uh, the Romulans were looking for terithium, and so Data and Jordy go back to the station to search for terithium. Any uh, signs of terithium? They find a secret room, and of course, Doctor Saron is there. Attacks Jordy, and of course, because Data is all emotional he's in fear whereas normally data would just grab him throw him against the wall and that would be that but because he's got the emotion chip in him he cowers and is all afraid and scared so he can't help Jordy. which leads to plot c which is data for the next little while feeling sorry for himself because he didn't help Jordy. Long story short, um, he launches a probe, destroys a star, which will be important later, and takes Jordy hostage and is beamed up by a Klingon bird of prey that decloaked. So Data and um, Riker, who was beamed down to try to find them because they couldn't find them and with the star being exploding they needed to get out of there so yes so data returns with Riker to the Danterprise D our main antagonist is on the Klingon board of prey that the, the cloaks and takes off so um, the next little while they're trying to figure out why he would want to do this and after some very lucky dedu deduction and a heart to heart between Data and Picard basically Picard telling Data snap out of it wake up we all have emotions blah 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 you just have to learn to deal with it get over it um, and do your darn job so <laughs> Uh, a whole bunch of pointless dialogue that really, really didn't need to be there and kind of took you out of it. Um, I think the whole Data arc would have been okay for a TV show, not so much in the movie. It just came across as added and just 
wasn't my cup of tea. So they figure out that the reason that he blew up, that he um, killed the star was to move this ribbon. The ribbon is uh, the Nexus, which is where he was trying to get at when the Enterprise B beamed him off his ship. So he's been trying to get back there ever since. And Picard talks to Guinan, and Guinan explains all about the Nexus in this time period. And it's a lot of a lot of conversation, a lot of dialogue, uh, and it kind of moves really slow. So then, once they've figured everything out, Picard orders the ship to the system in question. They go there. Uh, Picard, of course, knows that he's going to be there, so he transmits on an open frequency to the Klingon vessel. The Klingon vessel is a little apprehensive about going up against the Enterprise D. Long story short here, uh, they implant a basically a, a hidden camera within Geordi's visors and then in, into Geordi's visor, which helps him see and beam him back to the Enterprise and beam Picard down to where Soren is. So the reason they did this is so that they could uh, find out the shield modulation of the Enterprise so that they could attack the Enterprise and stand a chance. Um, and you get boring dialogue of the Klingon women saying oh how human women look repulsive and a whole bunch of other dialogue and pointless stuff and Picard is on the surface trying to reason with Zarin which of course doesn't end well um, finally Jordy does go down to engineering they get the screenshot of what they want so they attack the Enterprise and successfully attack it however um, due to a malfunction in that type of bird of prey the Enterprise is able to destroy it before the Enterprise is completely destroyed however due to the damage that the Enterprise took it ends up crashing uh, on the surface now we go to the planet where Picard keeps trying to reason with Soren. Once he realizes that's fatal, he tries to get to him, but he can't because there's a force field, of course. And then Picard, of course, finds the one loophole where there's a gap in the uh, in the um, force field, so he manages to get through. Now. The one question I have about it is, and it's never really explained how Picard pulled this off. Picard is not a young chicken. He isn't a young chicken now, and he wasn't a spring chicken then. So they show the shot of Picard trying to get through this narrow opening within the um, the force field, and he's he's caught, and... Sauron fires his weapon and obliterates that whole area. Now, before he fired his weapon, Picard was trapped, like couldn't move. But yet somehow he manages to get away from there before that area is completely destroyed, which is like a matter of two, three minutes. Plot armor. Gotta love it. So anyway, uh, he carries on thinking that he's disposed of Picard, only to have Picard show up in front of him a couple of minutes later, which, um, again, without a transporter, not exactly sure how that happened, but okay. And they fight, and of course, the first time, Picard does not successfully stop him. He launches his rocket, he kills the star, the ribbon is pulled to the planet, and they're poof in the Nexus. Now, 
earlier I mentioned that Picard had got a message from Earth. The message was telling him that his brothers, his brother and his young son and, and uh, family had burned to death and that they had passed, um, which Picard took um, very, very hard because uh, this is kind of plot line B, C, D, whatever you want to put it, um, that Picard always felt that he didn't have to pass on his family line because his brother already had. And now with his brother's family gone, the Picard line ends with him. And so he's upset and depressed about this. And um, his. so when he gets into the Nexus, his nephew is alive, he has a family, he has kids, a wife, all the things that he didn't do because he put his career ahead of family. Um, so this is his dream life. And somehow, Guinan is there. Uh, it's kind of explained as if she's kind of an echo of Guinan. She's what Guinan left behind, which means, okay, she's a ghost. But anyway, uh, she's there for plot device. She's there, and Picard, of course, realizes this is all just fake, and he chooses to uh, turn away. So he asks Guinan, can I leave? And she tells him that he can leave. Uh, it's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when and where he wants to leave too, because magically with the Nexus, you can go back to any point in time, any, uh, no problem. So he goes, well, okay, I need you to help me. And he, she says, well, I can't leave because technically I'm already gone, but I know somebody who can. And poof, we cut to Picard walking in through trees and he sees Kirk chopping wood outside a cabin. Convenient much. Anyway, so after they talk and they, uh, Kirk, Picard is trying to convince him that he has to come with him, but at the same time Kirk is, well this is um, where uh, I told my, the love of my life that I was going to go back to Starfleet and I ended up with an empty home, blah, 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 blah. And so Kirk's like, no, nah, I don't want anything of your mission. I'm going to do this right this time. And then he goes up to his room where she's supposed to be waiting. And nope, it's not his room. It's the stable. And then Kirk goes, oh, this is the stable, and I took this horse out, and this is where I first met her. I can do it all from the start. And he gets on the horse, and he takes off, and Picard, of course, finds a saddle and presumably will be give chase. And Kirk goes galloping away, and he jumps this ravine, stops, jumps it again, and he stops. And then Picard comes trotting up beside him, and they have this long conversation, long story short. Um, Kirk now realizes that this is all fake. It means nothing. And after a few lines, like the um, the most quoted one would be, never let them promote you, never let them do anything to take you out of that chair, because well, as long as you're in the chair you make a difference. So Picard hits him on that and says, well, come with me and make a difference again. And then, of course, Kirk relents and says, well, who am I to argue with the captain of the Enterprise? So they go off and they go just like that, are able to poof. And they're right back to when Picard... Uh, the ship is crashing again. Picard sees his opening. Um, but this time, it's not Picard that shows up in front of him, in front of Sauron. It's Kirk. And they do the little banter of, uh, 
uh, who are you? And Picard says, he's Captain James D. Kirk. Don't you know your history? And blah, blah, blah. And they have a big fight. And, I mean, it is a okay scene. Um, and, of course, with Kirk's help, he's able to... Uh, for, uh, thwart him this time. He's able to um, make it so that he doesn't uh, kill the star and everybody's saved and everything's good. Unfortunately, in the processes of doing this, Kirk actually dies. Um, so they're going for Kirk goes out doing what he lived for making a difference or at least that's the that's the theme of the movie for Kirk is he he missed making a difference he missed uh, being the person in the chair making the difference so Kirk goes out making the difference so Picard uh, buries him on the top of the mountain where they are uh, in, a, in a bunch of rocks he lays down the the old uh, the old uh, Starfleet badge on top and just as he does that magically a shuttlecraft appears and it's a rescue crew for the Enterprise which um it's never really explained how. I mean, the Enterprise D lands on the on the planet, and I don't mean it lands; it crashes. It just it's obliterated. Uh, I mean, the hull is still intact, and but it is out of commission. It is done. So it's never really, um, you know, like there's no throwaway line like. Uh, Thankfully, the the transponder still worked, or the distress call still worked. There's none of that. No, no, no real uh, explanation. Um, and then uh, they're digging through the wreckage. Uh, Picard f get retrieves his family album that he was looking at earlier on in the movie, and Riker says, "You know, I I always thought I'd be able to go after that chair and." Picard says the, the the line, you still may get to, I have a feeling this is not the only, this is not the last ship to be, to bear the name Enterprise. And then they're beamed up. And that's pretty much the movie. Um, so my overall thoughts on the movie itself, um, the pacing had some pretty slow spots to it. Um... There was a lot of plot convenience. Um, I did not like what they did to Data. Um, giving him the emotion chip and just kind of having that as the comic relief, because that's pretty much what Data was in this movie, was the, com was the comedic relief. And also they needed that for the plot hole of, well, he can't save Geordi because he's too scared. Whereas... Data without the emotion ship would have, you know, saved Jordy and Soren would have been captured and that would have been the end of the movie. Which I think might have been a better way to end it. But overall, I'd say this movie is about a 4 out of 10. It's not my favorite and it's not the worst. That one's yet to come. Um, but anyway, uh, this has been my first review, so please be kind. And if you like this video, please like, share, subscribe, downvote it if I did absolutely terrible. Please, uh, any input or suggestions would be great. Uh, I read every comment, and uh, I don't mind criticism. I don't mind uh, if you disagree with me. Um, please feel free to leave any comment you like. Um, again, I'm hoping to be able to do more of these, um, but I'm kind of still getting used to it. 
So with that said, I'll end this video here. And again, if you like this, please like, share, subscribe, and um, take care easy, folks.